Hi everyone, Patek here. For today's video, it will be another bookish pet peeves video. Uh, the last time I did this kind of video, it was uh, two months ago, and it was about cover art and cover design. I still have a lot of issues on that topic, but I will leave that for someday. For today's topic, it will be about book reviews. Now, I've mentioned this several times now that I've been a book reviewer, especially on Goodreads, for almost five years now. And I know that Goodreads as a site has a lot of issues, but personally, I must say that most of my experience there have been really nice. But even then, I still encounter some things that I don't agree with. And that's the point of today's video. It will be about five things that readers or reviewers often do that I don't agree with. Now, this doesn't mean that they're completely wrong or my way is the right way. It's not like that. I'm just saying that I don't agree with this. And if anybody watching this still want to continue doing it, it's up to them. I'm not forcing anyone. But first things first, today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. I've seen a few booktubers collaborating with Skillshare several times now, and I've always wanted to receive the same opportunity because I love what Skillshare is doing. For those of you who don't know, Skillshare is an online learning community. There's a lot of classes on Skillshare, like thousands of them on topics such as illustration, graphic design, book design, photography, animation, music production, video making, and many more. One of the classes I've taken so far is video editing for absolute beginners in HitFilm Express by Uwais Adam. This class is so helpful, especially for those who want to start their own channel but still want or need to learn all the important basics of video editing first. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in my description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. I highly recommend you to check it out. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. And the first one that I want to talk about is giving a rating to an unreleased book. It doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative, I never give a rating to an unreleased book. Seriously, not even books by my favorite authors. I mean, judging from my past experience with these books, I know that it's quite likely that if I give a five stars rating to any books in the Stone Light Archive by Brandon Sanderson or any book by John Gwynn, it's, it's really possible that they will end up receiving 4.5 or five stars out of me anyway. But Still, I will not do that. In the end, these aren't 100% and I'm always giving rating and reviews based on what I've read. I cannot give rating to a book that I haven't read. And I know that some readers use this rating on Goodreads especially as a metric for excitement. So they give 5 stars if they feel so excited about this release. And they give 1 star if they don't feel excited about a release. From my perspective, why even bother giving a rating or even including it in your TBR pile? Just throw it away. It's all a bit odd to me and I wish uh, I wish that Goodreads could somehow employ something that prevent this from happening. I don't know how maybe like giving proof that you actually own the book before you can give the rating or something. I'm not sure what it is but something in my opinion has to be done. And the second point that I want to mention is kind of related to the first one and it is recommending a book you haven't read. I know this sounds crazy, but this has happened several times. I've seen several reviewers on Goodreads uh, recommending a book or series they haven't read. So for example, they mentioned on their review, this book would be perfect for someone who loved this series. But then I asked that person, why is it similar to that series? They have no idea. Why? Because they haven't read the series. So why put the name of that series in the first place? For example, this is just to make a point and I have never seen this one happening. Let's say the book is Lies of Loklamora. This reviewer will say that this book is perfect for those who love Hunger Games. But how? And obviously the Lies of Loklamora and the Hunger Games aren't similar at all. When this kind of situation happens, especially if it's a reviewer that I know, I'm inclined to question, how is it similar to the Hunger Games? Now, it's an entirely different matter if they mention a warning at the beginning. So for example, again, I'm using the Lies of Lok Lamora as an example because it's a cool name. This person mentioned in their review, I've never read the Hunger Games, but a lot of reviewers have mentioned that this will be perfect for those who love the Hunger Games. Now, that's totally okay with me to have admitted that they haven't read the Hunger Games. They're recommending it based on what they've heard. And that's totally okay with me. And lately, somehow, there have been a lot of sequel series, and you know what happens with sequel series, right? People will ask, can we jump immediately into this book? Well, I personally almost will never jump immediately into a sequel series without reading the first series. That's just me. And I totally understand that sometimes a sequel series could totally work. Could totally work. But what bothers me is when someone mentioned that the previous series doesn't have any impact on this, when they haven't read the previous series, how would you know they don't have any impact? 
you haven't even read the previous series. If they mentioned that this is entirely possible to enter without reading the previous series, I was still able to understand the main plot, I was still able to understand the characterizations, I missed some details, that's okay. But why mention that the previous series doesn't have any impact? Because from my experience, the previous series always have an impact on the sequel series. Always. In some worst cases, and this has actually happened, the reviewer said, I know that this is the second book of a series, but it doesn't work for me. I probably should have read the first book first. You think that number in the series exists for a reason. Two comes after one. This isn't Star Wars where you can watch four, five, six, and then one, two, three. It doesn't work that way. But there is an exception to this. Of course, if the series is a series of standalone novels, let's say like uh, The Mortal Techniques by Rob J. Hayes or the Ryria Chronicles by Michael J. Sullivan. I do believe that any book in that series can be entered without reading any of the other books. Although I personally, again, will always start from publication order. Always. But again, this is just me. This is just my thoughts. And the third point that I want to mention is books are immediately categorized as YA if the books didn't work for them. Now, here's the thing. I don't read a lot of YA fantasy books. I think all of you probably already know that. But I've read some of the most popular and highly praised YA fantasy books. They didn't really work for me. The majority of the time, I either feel lukewarm or feel disappointed by them. But this doesn't mean that all YA are bad. There are YA readers that think adult fantasy are bad because adult fantasy aren't suitable to their taste. And this is just the same thing. YA fantasy are mostly unsuitable to my taste, but I know YA fantasy that work for me exists. There are a lot of readers in this world. Just because a book doesn't work for you and you don't like reading YA fantasy doesn't mean that a book should immediately be categorized as YA just because it didn't work for you. This has happened several times and this brings me to my next point, which is young characters or fantasy books written by women are immediately categorized as YA immediately. This situation usually happens a lot to a coming-of-age fantasy that has a magic school and featured a younger main characters. A few examples on this would be Blood Song by Anthony Ryan, The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang, or The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss, and there are a lot of examples. Now, these are all, in my opinion, and I really think of them as adult fantasy. And I know a lot of readers agree with me. However, what if the reader dislike these books? Well, they call it YA fantasy. And yeah, I've seen this happening so many times. I'm not joking, some people even called the first law, I have no idea why, the first law by Joe Abercrombie and A Song of Ice and Fire as YA fantasy. Now think about that, that is so insane. Just because a fantasy series featured a younger main character, it doesn't immediately mean that it's a YA fantasy. At least from my perspective, it doesn't. The characterizations, the complexity of the world building, the writing style, all of them have to be considered before calling it a YA fantasy, especially the world building. Another example of this is the Lycanius trilogy by James Islington or Red Rising Saga by Pierce Brown. Usually people immediately call them YA when they've read only the first book. Now, seriously, the second and third book, or even more for the Red Rising Saga, is not YA at all. For the Lycanius trilogy, the second and third book improved the difficulty of the series tremendously. It's one of the most complex fantasy series that I've read. I will be doing a full series review on Lycanius trilogy on this channel soon because I want to talk about it. And then for the Red Rising Saga, Dark Age, the fifth book in the series, is one of the most violent and darkest book that I've ever read. Seriously, out of all medium, it is one of the most violent, depressing, and darkest book that I've ever read. How it's even called YA, it's beyond me. And it's already that way since the second book. I never thought of Red Rising Saga ever since the first book as a YA series. I've never thought of it that way. There is similarity to the Hunger Games, but just because there is a similarity to a YA series doesn't mean, again, that it's immediately YA. And don't even get me started on books written by women immediately categorized as YA. It's insane. The entire 16 books in the realm of the Elderlings by Robin Hobb, in my opinion, is one of the most satisfying, captivating, and mature storytelling that I've read in fantasy. It is one of my favorite series of all time. Again, some people call it YA fantasy, just because Fitz was young in the first book. Poppy War Trilogy by R.F. Kuang is very dark. It's a very dark series. It's grim, it's violent, and it depicts the atrocities of war very mercilessly. It's still often called as a YA fantasy series. Another example is the Greenbone Saga by Fonda Lee. Again, it's one of my favorite series, and this has also been called as YA fantasy by several readers because, well, I don't have to tell you that anymore, right? <laughs> and lastly, gatekeeping. 
Okay, to be honest, I probably will have to make an entire video on this topic because this is one of the things I despise most about any kind of community, any kind of genre. I despise gatekeeping with my heart. With all my heart, I despise gatekeeping. And I will just say this for now. I disagree with gatekeeping in all possible way. Seriously. You don't have to finish The Wheel of Time. You don't have to finish The Malazan Book of the Fallen. You just have to finish and love a fantasy book in order for you to be called a fantasy reader. It's simple as that. I could talk about gatekeeping all day long if I wanted to. I probably will make a video on this in the future when I'm feeling very salty. I've had a lot of bad experience on this topic and one day I will tell you all about it. I probably will make a video on this topic again one day in the future because there are still some things, there are still some things that I don't agree with, but let's leave that for another day. And especially on the topic of gatekeeping, that one will require a single video dedicated to it. Anyway, that's it for me today. Let me know what are some of your pet peeves on book reviews. And as always, thank you so much for watching and thank you for your support. Bye bye.